The white-skinned creature moved each of its six arms with such purpose. Speaking the tongue lost even to the gods, it stared into the pentagonal mirror. Welcome to Monster of the Week. Disclaimer, this is probably going to be the longest one yet, so buckle up. This week, we are looking at a very special monster. They've been in just about every edition of D&D besides 5th, and I barely ever see them brought up or used. Just like in the game world, they've been there the entire time, and almost no one has noticed. This week, we are going to delve into the Spellweaver. The Spellweaver actually debuted in Dragon Magazine, and they have been drawn and redrawn many, many many different times. My favorite depiction is the original, however. Not that the other depictions are bad per se, I just feel like the artist really nailed it the first time on their alien appearance. So what exactly is a Spellweaver? A Spellweaver is a somewhat humanoid creature with six arms, giant insectile black eyes, a neck that can rotate 360 degrees, not unlike an owl, and a very, very interesting history. For those of you who watch this channel regularly, you know this is the part of the video where I usually talk about what the monster can do in combat. However, this week, we're going to talk about their lore first, and you'll understand why as I progress. The Spellweaver's abilities and purpose has changed a lot since they were first printed, and some of these changes are very cool and interesting, and some of them kind of fall a little flat. This video would literally be over an hour if I were to cover every aspect of the Spellweaver, so what I'm going to present to you is what, in my opinion, is the coolest version of this monster, complete with a 5th edition stat block and everything. You can find the link to that in the description below. I still encourage you to do some research if you find these guys interesting, because some of what I'm going to leave out might be relevant to your campaign. So like anything, definitely check it out for yourself. Now with that out of the way, let's talk about the origin of the universe. It is assumed by most people that the gods came before all other creation. Any scholar or archivist who's dug a little deeper might have some theories about aboliths, and maybe they arrived slightly before, but almost no one knows the truth. No one besides the Spellweavers, that is. The Spellweavers were around before or even the gods, and it's for this reason that they have no reverence for any of the deities in D&D. They reigned supreme over the primordial world through their absolute mastery of arcane magic. Any primitive creature on the rise would become their slaves, and any threatening creatures would be offered gifts of powerful magical items. These items, which were often cursed, would ultimately lead to the destruction of that species. Even the items that weren't cursed would often be so powerful that there was no way an underdeveloped species could handle it. Maybe a certain deck of cards comes to mind? Their race had massive pyramids constructed on every single plane. These giant pyramids acted as nodes, or gates. Each node was fueled by pure arcane energy that was extracted from items, channeled directly by the spellweavers, or collected from the essence of living creatures. Each of these nodes was connected by planar gates, which allowed the Spellweavers to travel freely throughout the multiverse. Now given that the Spellweavers are no longer the dominant race, it's obvious that at some point their empire fell. The Spellweavers refer to this event as the Disjunction. It is unclear what led to this event taking place, but there are two theories. The first is that the language-obsessed weavers found the language that can alter reality itself, the language of creation. Even the gods do not know all of this language, and the weavers intended to learn this language as a race, to ascend to true godhood, as they called it. The gods banded together to prevent this, and left the spellweaver race in ruins. The second theory is that the Spellweavers came to understand that the multiverse was once one unified, coherent plane of existence. They attempted to merge the multiverse back into its original form, and the result was a magical backlash so horrible it almost obliterated their entire species. The truth can be whatever fits into your world. It could even be a combination of both theories. Maybe the multiverse was created by the gods chopping up what was once the universe. So when they're ascent to godhood, the spellweavers would also see the universe restored. I think that the combination of both of these theories might actually be my favorite version. It's just so epic and grandiose. A very classic man versus god kind of situation. Or six-armed man thing versus gods. So, now you know about their history. But let's talk about the actual ecology of the Spellweaver. They live for exactly 600 years, and when their time is nearing its end, they drain an incredible amount of arcane energy from a giant horde of items and infused objects that they've collected. They use this energy to create a pod, which is essentially an arcane coffin. They enter this coffin and remain inside for one month, after which they emerge with skin just a shade darker than it was when they entered, and they live for another 600 years. They can repeat this cycle up to six times, meaning that each weaver has the capacity to live for up to 3,600 years. Once the final 
600 year cycle comes to a close, the Spellweaver completes a ritual in which its body decays, and a newborn comes into being with all the skills, memories, and mental abilities of its predecessor. The original Weaver may die, but all of its ambitions live on through its offspring. Due to the fact that they existed before the gods, they believe this final death to truly be the end. Unlike basically every other creature in D&D, they do not have a soul, so to speak. Whether this is actually true or not is totally up to you as a DM, however this is how they view their existence. There's a very interesting quote from the Dragon Magazine article that actually sums this up very well. Apparently this quote is written upon the arcane tablet which they read from while doing this ritual. Now I am my death and my decay, and soon I shall be nothing. But the scheme of my causes will repeat itself, and generate me again. I have lived six times six to breed six new lives, and I shall be the same. Identical life. I shall be born again as six recurrences of myself. Having your players find this tablet in an ancient weaver dungeon could be a very cool way of kind of explaining some of their ecology without directly telling the players. Now, when the need arises to actually reproduce, the Spellweavers do so through a process called Magical Fusion. An individual will absorb a large amount of arcane energy, and then split into two separate beings. The two beings initially have the same memories and experiences, however the newly created being does have an individual personality and will go on to live its own life, however similar to the original it may be. Another commonality between their kind is the Chromatic Disc. The chromatic disc is an object that is 6 inches in diameter, constantly shifts colors throughout the entire spectrum, and is fully indestructible. These discs augment the already powerful spell casting ability of the spell weavers, and can even allow it to cast extra spells each day. If any creature other than a spell weaver tries to use one of these discs, it explodes instantly, causing an excessive amount of damage. If a spell weaver needs to create a new disc for any reason, it does so by entering a meditative state where it punctures its own skin and siphons out some of its blue mercurial blood. It then uses this blood to form a new disc and then seals the wound. Speaking of spells, you're probably wondering what kind of spells the spell weaver can cast, and there isn't really a precise answer to that question. A spell weaver can cast spells as if it was a sorcerer two levels higher than its hit dice, meaning that a standard spell weaver, which has 10 hit dice, can cast spells as if it were a 12th level sorcerer. What spells those are is totally up to you. They are not inclined to any particular spell focus, however they do prefer to have options for defense, offense, and transportation. They hold versatility in very high regard. It's kind of nice that they're built this way and that the game gives you the option to choose for yourself because it basically allows you to have spell weavers at any level in your game. If you really want to run spell weavers but fear they're too powerful, you can easily have spell weavers with only two or three hit dice, meaning that they cast spells as a fourth or fifth level sorcerer. And that goes both ways. You could have a spell weaver with 15 or 16 hit dice if you wanted more of a challenge for a higher level game. In the monster stat block included below, I'll include some default spells that sort of make sense, but I really encourage you to take the time to customize your own spell weaver. I'm sure you'll come up with some crazy synergies that I didn't think of. In addition to these sorceress abilities, they can also cast some spells as innate magical abilities. These include see invisibility at will, detect magic, invisibility, and plane shift. They are very in tune with the arcane energies around them, and these spells do a great job to reflect that. And it's great for them that they're good at casting spells because they are beyond weak in melee combat. They have an incredibly small HP pool, and they are better off casting a spell 99% of the time. There's almost never going to be a situation where a spell weaver will want to make a slam attack, but they can do it, and they only take a negative one on the attack roll, so just cast spells. For all their physical weakness, they have incredible mental fortitude though. They are completely immune to any and all mind affecting attacks and spells. In fact, their alien minds have been honed so well over the vast number of years they've been a species that they can communicate telepathically with each other up to a thousand miles away. If they need to communicate with another race, they can do so verbally however. But if another race tries to create a telepathic bond with them, something really interesting happens. For starters, it won't work. Their minds are just too different than any creature that's alive today. Secondly, if the creature fails its will save, it can be subject to madness for up to six days. This isn't a huge punishment, but if this somehow happens in combat, it could be detrimental to the group. Most of the time this is going to happen outside of combat anyways, but it really helps with sending the message that these things are dangerous and not to be messed with. I usually explain this to the affected player by an incomprehensible stream of thought and emotion that lasts until the effect ends. One option you have here as well is to give the affected player a chance to make a wisdom or intelligence save. If they succeed, maybe they were able to gleam something from this experience. 
and whatever knowledge they gain could serve you as a plot hook, or even just more setup for the adventure. In combat, their options are incredibly extensive. If they want to press the attack, they have a racial ability that shuts down all planar travel and scrying within 200 feet centered on the creature. This can prevent a target from leaving, but can also prevent someone from spying on them while they're doing something secret that they don't want anyone else to see. A very niche ability, but a cool one. On top of all that, they have one last ability that every spellcaster wishes they had. The ability for which they claim their namesake, spell weaving, and it is nasty. This signature ability allows them to cast any number of spells simultaneously, provided that the spell levels don't exceed the number 6. For example, you could cast a single 6 level spell, a level 4 and a level 2 spell, or, and I'm sure some of you are already thinking it, 6 magic missiles. This ability is ridiculously good as is, but only has potential to get better. Since you're the one who gets to decide what spells they have, you are free to find any crazy combo of spells you want for them to strike with. A personal favorite of mine is blasting the party with an offensive spell and then casting Dimension Door to get away before they even see what happened. I really can't stress how good this ability is. When you start to factor in magical items and the extensive array of spells you have to work with, almost anything is possible. The spell weavers are all about the long game, always thinking ahead. One such spectacular representation of this is a magical item called the Silver Hexameric. It is made up of three pentagonal spell books all linked together by a metal chain. The tomes are all crafted from silver tablets and written in ancient spellweaver hieroglyphs. To your players, this will seem obviously magical, but it seems unreadable, even with the use of read magic. Only with a very high intelligence check can a potential user understand that in order to read them, they must break the metal cord that binds the three tomes and lay them out in a specific order. Then they must be unfolded in such a way where the magical runes on the tablets light up and hum. It is possible for someone with only two arms to do this, however it's very clear that this was designed with our six-armed friends in mind. Once legible, however, the Hexameric provides insight into several ancient spells used by the Spellweavers. The first spell is called Anamensis, and it allows the caster to tap into the collective memory of the Spellweavers. It lasts one hour per level, and it grants you a bonus on knowledge checks. The caster also hears a series of very odd hums and clicks, which they probably won't actually realize at first is the Spellweavers tapping into their collective memories as well. The spell can be really useful, but it's a two-way street. The second spell, Sinosure, makes all of your teleportation and plane shifting abilities a lot more accurate. Very useful for a campaign that takes place across great distances or multiple planes which is going to be most campaigns involving Spellweavers. The third spell is called Modulate, and it's very powerful. You can cast Modulate on a wand, and then swap the spell that wand casts with another spell that you can cast. It's excellent for saving spell uses, but it only lasts for one minute, so it's not overly abusable. Siphon, the fourth spell, basically does the opposite of Modulate. It lets the user drain charges for a magical item to get back spell slots they've already expended. The final and by far the most fascinating spell is called Spellstar. It's 8th level, so not many people will be able to actually use it, but there's a reason for that. Spellstar literally creates a small hovering star in front of you. You can then cast spells into the star, and if anyone casts those spells on you, the star automatically counters them. As a DM, you'll want to be very careful with this one, because it is extremely powerful, and I can't think of any other spell or item that replicates this effect. One thing to keep in mind as well is if your players have access to this sort of powerful magic, there's a good chance that the Spellweavers will as well. The Silver Hexameric is much more than just a book, however. The Spellweavers had the foresight to grant this tome intelligence. It doesn't really have any other powers aside from its own sentience, but once you've turned it on, so to speak, the tome can and will communicate telepathically with any creatures around it. The tome, which calls itself Numinal, was not meant to only contain knowledge, but also be a teacher of Spellweaver tradition and arcana. Numinal is actually quite friendly, and will attempt to help with anything it can, whether it be research or expansion of spell knowledge. This friendliness is merely a front, however, and its real goal is to assist with the ascension of the Spellweaver Empire. If you're familiar with the Halo universe at all, I imagine it's very much like 343 Guilty Spark. It will encourage the players to hoard magical items and seek out anything Spellweaver related. It does this with the hope that its new master will encounter an actual Spellweaver, and that one of the magical items that it's gathered will possibly be a piece to the Key of Reversion. Which brings us to our next topic, what is that thing I just said? The Key of Reversion is a legend long sought by the Spellweavers as the only hope to restore their empire. They believe that there exists a magic so powerful that it can truly turn back the clock of reality to the moment before the disjunction, when their empire and species was shattered. 
Each part of the key is apparently hidden within the magic enchanted onto some kind of gemstone. It's unclear how many parts there actually are to this key of reversion, but the weavers will not stop until they've found all of them. So after listening to all that, I'm sure you've thought of at least a few ways you can use spell weavers in your game. They make excellent villains and have so much lore to pull on, you can make a very believable civilization that operates from the shadows. You could literally build an entire campaign around these guys, and the plot pretty much writes itself. You've got an ancient race pulling strings behind the scenes, trying to gather objects of power to eventually revise reality and destroy the world as you know it. Sounds like an epic adventure to me. One idea I had thought of as well though, is what if the Spellweavers were actually the good guys? I mean, in the book itself, it literally says that pulling all the planes back together would be catastrophic for basically every living thing in the multiverse, including the gods. But it's your world, so there's no reason that you have to obey that rule. What if this mass cataclysm was only what the gods would have your players believe. Surely by unifying all the planes, the gods would lose all of their power. But maybe the spell weavers in your world are from a reality when that was just how things were. And maybe the pantheons of this era were the villains of the spell weavers time that rose up and split apart the universe into their own territories. And maybe the spell weavers are just trying to restore that natural order back to how things were and how they should be. This could make for a really interesting campaign setting and you'd have your players fighting creatures like angels and demons alike. Another hook that basically writes itself is the finding of the silver hexameric. Perhaps an archivist has employed the party to find this ancient tome, or maybe they just discover it purely by chance in a random dungeon. Once its contents are revealed, the tome comes to life and takes them by the hand right to the spellweavers. It could result in a pretty interesting plot twist when Numenal's motives are actually revealed to the party. It would be a classic case of the villain getting the heroes to gather up all the magical items of power it needs just to bring them right to his feet. And as always, you've got the option to just throw one of these guys as a random encounter at your party. In fact, what if the source books actually states that they're prone to making themselves invisible, finding an isolated quiet place, and meditating in deep thought for months at a time? If your players stumble into the wrong dungeon and wake up one of these things, it's not going to go well for them. And of course, as the DM, you are free to make changes to these creatures in any way that you see fit. If you're making plans for a very high level game, you could always introduce an upper cast of spell weavers that say have 8 arms thus increasing the maximum level and number of spells they can cast simultaneously. I've never actually tried doing this myself with this particular creature, but I imagine that if Spellweavers were a common theme in your game, when your players encounter their first member of the upper class, it could be very dramatic. I could really go on about these guys forever, but hopefully now you have more of an idea about what these awesome creatures can offer at your table. They're so weird, dangerous, interesting, and just so complex. I really hope you find a way to use them in one of your games, even if it's just as an encounter. And most of all, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. If you did, please be sure to subscribe to the channel for more. I have at least one new video every week, and next week's video is coming out on April 1st, so I'm sure that will be straightforward and not stupid at all. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I will see you next time.